Okay, I think we're all good to go. So thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, yeah, my name is Steve Kruger. I'm currently working uh, at Grab. I'm head of Grab Platform. Um, quick couple of words. Um, I'm very humbled to speak to you today about um, some of the things that we do at Grab, um, specifically with Go. Um, you know, really just to start off with the, the problem that, that was um, one of the reasons for starting Grab from our, from our co-founder, Hui Ling, where traveling in Southeast Asia, for those of you who have experience, um, before you know the ride, the ride sharing explosion happened, how, how, how it's changed since then. So one of the problems that she personally had as a consultant traveling across Southeast Asia was one of safety, where she actually had to pretend to be on the phone whilst in a ride traveling as a consultant across the region, just so that she, you know, if she was in any unsafe situation, she could pretend to be on the phone and, and be, be able to get hold of somebody or, or, or feel that she was a safer be able to speak to somebody on the phone during that ride. We've since transformed the industry, um, focusing on safety, reliability, and servicing the entire region in a way which has, has just been able to grow the entire region in a way we can see here today with all the new faces. Um, so what started as a ride hailing platform really now is Southeast Asia's number one consumer internet platform. We're currently in eight countries, well over 500 cities if you count payments. Um, and, and we just keep on growing. If you look at the mobile downloads, 90 million downloads on the App Store. We work across, you know, rideshare, shuttle, pay, eat, all you can do. We serve over 5 million micro entrepreneurs across the region. So really a comprehensive platform. A lot of this driven through Go. So we're going to hopefully show you some insights into our back-end systems and how that works. So the agenda today is going to be a brief technical history of, of how we started. We didn't start off with Go. We'll go through some of that. Um, we'll show you how we use Go within Grab. Um, we'll look at some of the architectural choices and missteps that we've done during the early um, forays in the system. Um, and we'll look at some focused individual projects that we've co sort of internally developed to help us through the kind of scale and challenges that we've had as we've seen the stellar growth. Um, and uh, give you a little bit of a, a teaser as to what's next for the Grab platform. So in the beginning, sounds like a fairy tale once upon a time, we had this big monolith. There's actually two back-end systems, one for the passenger service, PAX, for those who are familiar with the terminology of the industry, um, which was written in Node.js, uh, sorry, the driver back-end was written in Node.js, and the passenger back-end was written in Ruby and Rails, for those of you who remember that platform. Very easy to rapidly prototype stuff, get it out there, but as pretty much everybody who's done any real Ruby on Rails enterprise development finds out, that when you start hitting scale, a um, little bit more problematic. But anyway, it worked back then, helped us get into the market and, and start rapidly servicing a large user base, all driven off a single MySQL database, um, which still serves us well, but obviously back then it was a much simpler infrastructure. So it was simple and yet functional. Deployment was really simple. It was somebody's SSHing into a machine, doing a git pull, doing an npm install for the node server, and just starting the Ruby on Rails service by hand. And it, it worked. It was simple and it worked. But clearly wouldn't, wouldn't work in, in today's market where we are to, with the number of customers and so on that we serve today. Come around to 2014, uh, a year later, and our system had started decomposing into some very distinct components um, and subsystems, you could call it. We had, for example, a service which was interested in doing POI, point of interest. This is that, that useful um, functionality when you type in an address, that it can actually figure out where you are and decompose it in a way which is useful to the user rather than just a, a GPS coordinate or a, or a really base address. Because you need to be able to connect the passengers and the drivers in, in a much more accurate way. So we started seeing the emergence of this kind of a system. Um, we had the driver dispatcher internally. We called we call this Athena and Hermes systems, which was our back-end system for the driver app still written in Node.js, but now starting to emerge as a distinct system. The passenger system was called Gamma, which was this beast written in, in Ruby on Rails, um, which comprised the booking service, the passenger service, the pricing engine, um, and really the whole passenger side of, of the world. It was around this time in 2014 that we started seeing the emergence of the first Go services within our system. Um, the reasons for this were diverse. Um, some interesting anecdotal reasons for it was there was a bit of a battle internally between the Ruby on Rails developers and the Node.js developers and one of the ways to settle it was just to go for a neutral third party and go for Go. Um, <laughs> seemed to have worked out, <laughs> but uh, not, not for always the reasons you expect. 
But anyway, we started interest, implementing a couple of test services in Go, and they worked so well that we kind of bet the farm on it and decided this is the way we want to go. On the mobile side, we still had the classical um, Android apps for, for PAX and DAX. And on the um, driver side, we actually only had the Android app at that point in time. We didn't even have an iOS app for the, for the drivers at that point in time. So a nice snapshot back in time as to where we were with that. So based on, based on how good the few little Go services that we'd started writing were performing and the stuff we could do with them in production, we started to do a, a much more accelerated effort around saying, let's migrate our core functionalities over to these Go services. We needed a way to rapidly deploy new features to the system, and we needed to be able to focus infrastructure improvements on some problematic components. When you're dealing with a big monolith, you know, you can only scale that so far, and, and not all components in that monolith need to scale at equal rates or have equal needs on the system and bottlenecks. So the ability to decompose that using obviously a microservices architecture, but then using Go to solve that, gave us a lot of new capabilities, and that really accelerated our efforts to move over to Go. So um, we started a formal services migration effort over to Go. Um, initially, we focused on new development, so any new development happening within the system was developed using Go services, and at the same time, a parallel effort was put in place to do a one-for-one -one migration of the, of the existing monolith application over to individual Go services. Um, it was really an interesting project. I've got a little link down at the bottom there on, on, on a blog post that you could access for, for the interested parties in definitely going to download my presentation and click on that link. Um, but there's, there, there was really a, a fantastic effort involved in doing what we, we used to internally say was changing the jet engine while the jet was in flight. Um, we had the system that was under incredible pressure and we had to really scale this. You'll see in some of the graphs and some of the subsequent slides. And the way they did this was to do a one-for-one -one identical service um, porting into the, Go, so into the Go language and then did a production deployment of those two systems and routed the requests in parallel in real time to both of the, the old monolith service and to the Go service in real time. Obviously, that Go service wouldn't do a write access to the database. They mocked that out, but then actually compared those results between the actual service in the, in the legacy monolith compared with what the expected result was in the Go service. And once those matched and we could see that in the logs, then that said, right, this is stable enough and we can switch it over and just did a DNS change and port it and, and, and from that point forward, that service would then hit the new Go service. So really incredible effort from the engineering team to actually make that migration seamless from the customer's perspective. Um, some random facts around uh, this move on to Go. Uh, it completed in 2016. We had migrated the whole monolith over onto, onto Go services. Today, I did a quick uh, scan through the repo. We have over 37,000 individual Go files, and that's spread across 256 microservices. I don't know why that just sticks in my mind as a programmer. You 256, you immediately go base two, but it's an interesting number. It's probably 257 by now, so this is probably wrong. Um, the largest single Go file we have is, is 2,500 lines long for the reward service. I don't know if there's any rewards people here. They're probably embarrassed at that number, but they probably want to decompose that file a little bit. Just in the last month, we have over 3,000 source code commits um, of the last 30 days. And at last check on the, on the GitLab repository, we've got over 450 active Go contributors in our back end. So just an interesting insight into our, into our systems. Doing a, a bird's eye view on the spread of languages within our system, you'll notice that our Ruby code base went from 200k lines to 200k lines. Doesn't seem like much of an improvement, but to be fair, a lot of that was moving out all the callback and functionality, but still using it as a UI for some of our um, system's operations. So all the critical path functionality is basically out the system. So although embarrassing, it is, it is um, a lot better than it was. We've got a lot of front-end code, JSS, uh, CSS, JavaScript, HTML, etc. That's You can see it's gone up by a factor of 10. Um, we managed to get the node, sorry, the JavaScript. The node.js has gone down to zero, which is pretty good. Um, on our mobile applications, you can see a factor of 10 on the, on the iOS side. We've got a huge amount more of the Java code. Java is all on the Android development. There's, there's no Java backend code that we use in our systems today. Huge amount of con infrastructure and config files. But you can see Go, in three years, went from zero to two million lines of code. If you divide that up and do the math, which I sadly did a little bit earlier, um, that comes up to 1,000, 1.8 thousand 
lines of Go code every day for the last three years is what we've been outputting. Now, to be fair, that's not just, um, we don't run a sweatshop. <laughs> that is actually, a lot, you know, there's some boilerplate code in there, et cetera. But it doesn't include comments. It doesn't include white space. So that's an impressive number of, of lines of code of Go being developed. Um, to support that, we actually recently moved. We used to be on GitHub, had a private repo presence on GitHub, and we've recently moved into a, into a hosted GitLab repository, which supports some of our um, monolithic um, source code repository structure requirements. Anyway, a little shout out to Go, why we like it. Um, you know, obviously our ability to be able to focus teams and move them, um, for those of you who know the, the, the grab market, we, we have to quite often pivot and violently change direction, attack new markets, attack new verticals. And the ability to have developers switch focus to switch positions very, very rapidly in a very agile way was key. And one of the things with Go, as opposed to something like the old Ruby on Rails legacy database, is the ability for people to look at the code and very quickly get an understanding of it. The readability of Go is, is quite fantastic. When you look at some of the other um, systems, such as Java and Ruby, which have a much more um, deeper notion of object inheritance, you, you may have to drill through a real large infrastructure and, and hierarchy of code to really figure out the deep fun functionality. Whereas with Go code, you basically, what, what you see on the glass is what you get in terms of functionality. So it's very much easier to, to horizontally move people and focus them on new areas and, and be dynamic in that respect, which was key because as, as with everybody, we're always facing um, resourcing constraints and struggling to hire people fast enough. Um, as we as we started scaling up our Go requirements on the back end, um, you know, back in a couple of years ago, it wasn't quite a mature platform as it was now. It was, it was new for a lot of people, ourselves included. But as our needs evolved in the market, um, the actual maturity and the, the, F, the ecosystem and infrastructure platforms available for Go systems evolved at, at a rate even faster than we did, which made it very, very easy to adopt and to argue for, for, for um, expanding the scope of the, of the Go infrastructure within Grab. So um, it was a very, very, very good choice for us there. We have a lot of our third-party uh, tooling developed in Grab. It gives us the ability to contribute back to open source projects. Um, we have some of our internal tooling also developed in Grab. makes it easy to be able to apply developers on and off the code as and when needed. Um, and we really like the loose coupling capabilities of Go. Um, the fact that there's no real magic in it. It's just a solid, does what it says on the tin and, and, and that gets the job done. So the power for us in, in Go is really around its simplicity. Um, so with a few powerful paradigms, it really gets out the way as a language and lets you focus on solving the actual problems, of which we have many. Um, the Grab developer ecosystem has evolved for microservices. We'll go into this in a little bit more detail in some subsequent slides. Um, we've got some rigorous coding standards that we've developed around our, 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 process, our internal development processes around continuous integration, continuous delivery, and so on. Um, we settled on a mono repo approach. This is talking about the source code side of things, um, really just to minimize the complication around project, uh, project access, giving you know, various developers visibility on sub projects and a million projects spread across Git, GitLab or GitHub is always problematic. So we just got a big mono repo. It gives us great capabilities around some third party tooling we have. We can apply lint to the whole set of Go files. We can apply fixes rapidly. And given the, the, the microservice architecture and, and some, some tooling we'll show you a bit later with something called Grab Kit, it allows us to apply fixes and, and best practices and common patterns across our code base of microservices very, very rapidly. So, um, and also in terms of vendor management, which is one of the problematic, historically problematic areas with Go, um, using something like Glide with a mono repo was quite, quite useful for us as well. Um, this is an extract of a, a public communication slide that comes out every, um, every week sometimes because it, it changes so rapidly. But this is just an extract of that. Um, and you'll notice that although not intentional, the number of verticals launched every, well, over the year is, is increasing almost exponentially with time. Um, and this is really just to give you, I don't want to go into each one in detail, but just to give you an idea of the kind of pressure and, and things that we need to do from an engineering perspective to satisfy what the business is asking of us. Um, so this really drove some of the choices you'll see in the subsequent slides here. Because with success comes huge amounts of engineering challenges. 
Um, all that growth really translates into things that we have to do on the back end. It's quite hard to communicate the impact that this growth has on your ability to, to react to changing business needs while trying to you know, also satisfy those kind of scaling requests. Um, if you look at a picture of our infrastructure, um, this is a real snapshot of our um, Amazon deployed infrastructure where every point is an application and you can see the communication paths between those applications. Looks like a bit of a mess. It, it's, it's, to be fair, a little bit more structured than that. Um, but just to give you an idea of the difference in, in the application from the early years to what it is today and how rapidly it must have grown to get there. Um, so not only we do we need to scale our business verticals, but also engineering practices to support this kind of a, uh, this kind of a growth. So to go through some of that, um, we adopted a couple of key tenets which guide our engineering practices. So it's easy to start a new service, but when hundreds of services need to work together, you need to focus on a few core things. First one, scalability. It's not always easy to predict the requirements of, of um, what your service is going to need to do ahead of time. You don't know when there's going to be an acquisition or a consolidation. So what you need to build in terms of scalability is just to say, well, it needs to be more about configuration rather than re-architect every time somebody says, oh, you need to integrate this or you need to adapt to that market. We need to make sure it's more of a configuration change. Just add a slider to scale up a few more instances, more resiliency, etc. We need to have our services be extensible. The platform needs to be able to support unknown and often unforeseen operational characteristics. So you know you're going to need to adapt those services. Anything you can do to improve the extensibility of those services is going to be key. We know they need to be highly available. We are running critical infrastructure for the entire Southeast Asia region. When we go down, we affect GDP of countries. So it needs to be highly available. Um, it needs to be reusable. Services need to follow the same standards to communicate with each other. And they need to have the same conventions, the same authentication. We need to solve problems once and reapply it across all our set of services. They need to be maintainable. Um, it shouldn't be a set of messy pipes. We need to be able to apply existing patterns or new patterns to existing services. We need to be able to fix bugs once and roll it out to all the services in a reusable way. They absolutely need to be reliable. Um, and above all, they need to be secure. Um, the kind of data that we deal with is very, very valuable. It's very powerful, and a lot of people want to get access to it. So we need to make sure that security is a fundamental focus of our systems. And to date, that has been the case. So what do we need to do to support all of these things that we've been challenged with? If you look at a car, right? It has a couple of wheels, it has some power source, and it allows you to drive from A to B. That's cool. With the addition of a few minor, sometimes cosmetic, changes to that vehicle, you can actually get a much more customized, very focused functionality. You can make it an ambulance, you can make it an armored personnel carrier, you can make it a, a goods carrier, you can pull things with it. But at the end of the day, it's still a car. It still has four wheels, and it still has an engine, and gets you from A to B. Taking the same approach, we started defining what is it that makes an infrastructure reusable in terms of microservices. It needs to be obviously easy to manufacture, it needs to be easy to maintain, it needs to be safe to use. But the basal operational characteristics are really proven and tested. So we introduced our microservices uh, architecture. Nothing magical in here, it should look familiar to pretty much everybody who's working in this space. But you can see we have some core functionalities that you get out the box for free when you use our infrastructure, and we'll show you how to do that in the next slide. But we need to provide a logging capability. goes without saying. Um, we use a lot of stats generation, so once you have your service configured for stats, you can then apply logging and monitors and alerts on those systems to make sure that when they go down, you can either react to them from an automatic scaling perspective or actually from an operation perspective, restart them, debug them, etc. Tracing, following the complex flow, as you saw in that previous diagram of that spaghetti of, of services, being able to follow a particular flow or drill down and, on, on, and to try and identify um, some hidden operational characteristics which are problematic, we need to do that through some tracing capabilities. Circuit breakers, the ability to be able to resiliently handle temporarily or transient network outages without bringing down the whole system, without having cascading errors, 
that, that kill your system when the system come ba comes back up again because all these backed up requests suddenly start hitting the network. So we introduced some interesting circuit breaker functionality. Um, the ability to roll out functionality on an on a experimental basis to production systems. So feature control, we have to switch things on, switch them off, roll them back. All these are built into our microservices infrastructure. Now, no Go presentation would be complete without the mandatory screenshot of a command line. I know you guys love it. Um, but we have something uh, internally at Go called GrabKit. It sound, should sound very familiar for those of you who use GoKit, and there'll be a comparison on the next slide. But GrabKit allows us to rapidly develop a brand new ground up service and provide all of those capabilities out the box. So you don't have to focus on, on the, the redevelopment of what am I deploying into, what's the gateway stuff look like, what communication protocols am I going to use. You get asked to set of questions. What's your service called? What's your communication protocol? Do you want to use MySQL or Postgre uh, Post or you want to use Redis? A couple of little questions like that and we generate your service. You get this boilerplate code which is not only just boilerplate, it's actually fully functional with some gaps for you to actually implement your logic. Um, but it's optimized for development out the box. It features detailed panic recovery, easy profiling, can run in development mode. Um, it's compliant with Grab standards. We've got a lot of standards around directory structure and, and um, the libraries, the style conventions, the, the, all the things that, 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 that we, we do to control the quality of our internal code. And you get that all for free. And you can really focus on the business logic of your services. Interesting thing about the tool, you can actually rerun it once we, you know, if you get an updated version of GrabKit, we've introduced a new communication protocol or a new pattern. Running it again on your services lets you just modify all the boilerplate code in place, and you can get those characteristics for free without modifying the core business logic of your services. So we didn't reinvent GoKit, but we took what we like about it and customized it for our own use cases. So you can see a couple of things here. We're obviously inspired by GoKit, but doesn't depend on it. Um, and it goes beyond the ideas by adding a actual automatic code generation. So you get a complete service um, generated. We're probably going to look at open sourcing this and a couple of other components in the near future um, with our new uh, CTO, Theo. He, he is very uh, uh, supportive of open sourcing these kind of things. And there's a couple of really big pieces of projects that we're going to open source and we should be looking at this one as well. So what did we get out of this microservices approach? It obviously gave us much better um, deployment flexibility, but this does come at the cost of deployment complexity. Now, instead of having a single monolith, so it's great for the, the actual systems and engineers to deploy, you now have this huge array of microservices which all need to be deployed. And managing dependencies amongst these services is very, very hard. Also tracing requests across these services as you saw, we built in tracing capabilities into our core microservice architecture, but, but having that is absolutely critical to being able to debug these, these large distributed type of systems. And we use tools such as light steps, et cetera, to help us improve the root cause analysis on these systems. But one of the things we did learn, one of the lessons we did learn is ownership of these services is absolutely critical to identify. You need to know who to call when something goes down. You need to know what to call, right, because you, you need some logging and, and, and tracing, etc., to try and figure out where the problem is. But once you've identified that, clear ownership of the services is very, very critical. And this has been the most challenging aspects of, of the microservice proliferation in the back end at Grab, is that the teams themselves are chopping and changing and migrating and evolving along with the business at such a rapid rate that any central repository where we actually maintain a documentation on the ownership of these microservices gets very fast out of date. And, and it's a constant effort to try and ap keep that updated with the organizational structure. So just some, some caveats there. Um, a quick look at our stack. I'm not going to go into too much detail on this, but right up at the top, we've got some of the recommender system, what well, the systems that we use for recommendation, intelligent allocation of rides, etc., demand forecasting, natural language processing. We do a lot of intelligence on the back end. In the middle of the stack, we start seeing some of the, um, the ETA calculation uh, stacks that we use, well, the, the systems that we use for estimated time of arrival, the point of interest, search ranking, optimization, user profile, profiling, we do some fraud detection work, um, clustering, etc. Right down at the bottom, we're on, a, on an Amazon infrastructure. The usual, the usual suspects of Amazon, we use a lot of Amazon services. Um, as we grew, our story became 
more about the problems of many more people and more problems needed more solutions. So we've rapidly expanded our platform. You can see a year ago, Grab Taxi, Grab Share, Grab Express, which is parcel delivery, Grab Hitch, which is the ride sharing, multiple people in the single ride, um, Grab Car, Grab Bike, Grab Food. This was a year ago. Since then, we've added Grab Pay Wallet, Just Grab, Grab Shuttle, Rewards, Grab Now, directly Grab a Taxi, Coaches, Cycle. This is just in the span of 12 months. So you can see the sort of things that we're doing to our systems over the next five years, really, whether you need to travel, pay, eat, or find a valuable way to provide income for your family, we will be the platform for you. And just as a matter of interest today for the Singapore users, and, um, we've launched Grab Food in CBD of Singapore. So you can head to the App Store and download Grab Food and order your lunch, although I'm sure it's going to be just great what they're catering for us. Um, so we are building Southeast Asia's largest consumer internet platform with our friends. <laughs> At the core of every platform is data, and we are relentlessly customer-centric. We're powered by a stack that's generalizable, and over a five years of growth, we've, we've completely changed the way we look at our data. Today we have thousands of databases all geared towards building the best services for a wide range of customers. Our customers being consumers, drivers, agents, merchants, and really it's all about the data. And our data is what can create feedback loops that ultimately provide the best experiences for all of these customers. We have currently engineering centers across Singapore, Beijing, Seattle, Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam, uh, Jakarta, and Bengaluru. We have over 500 dedicated engineers. We are growing rapidly and expanding rapidly. Um, over the next 25 slides, I'm going to just say thank you and have a very good lunch. Thank you, Stephen, for giving us the talk just now. All right, so the first question is, uh, you have a single repo for all services. What is the benefit? So as, as I showed in the slides for, for who has fell asleep during that slide, um, the ability to, to have a, a kickoff point to be able to apply our tooling to that whole set of sub-projects in a single mono repo is quite a large one. A lot of the tooling around stuff like GitLab and GitHub, which we've chosen internally, is much more geared towards mono repo. Not a lot of them can work across the micro repo approach. So that was one of the big things for us. It's really around the tooling and utilities. Unfortunately, non mono repo tooling support is just not great. Okay. How do you manage multiple versions of the same component? Um, so we don't, we, we do kind of. Um, w one of the ways we do that is through rolling deployments, um, canary deployments. So we have the ability to, to and, and we're doing this much more uh, effectively with, 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 with the experimental platform from one of our dead gents down here. But, but effectively what you can do is you can have a new component and, and, and in, a, in a configurable way roll that out to a certain percentage are based on various characteristics. Could be geogra geographical by city, by country. It could be by vertical. It could be by customer, etc. So there's various ways we can we can handle multiple components running side by side because they have the ability to route requests to the new services. Um, but generally, we try and minimise that. Obviously, apart from the experimental and and and, and prototyping type work. But uh, yeah. Why MySQL, why not Pocono or MariaDB? Um, I think historically we'd, we'd sort of gone off with MySQL and uh, we, we actually moving, MySQL is actually very underrated. It, it's performed adequately. Uh, generally when it has problems, it's because you're doing something wrong. And in those instances, we re-evaluated and looked at the actual modeling that we were doing and more often switched to a completely different paradigm, something like Redis or some NoSQL type solution rather than move off um, MySQL. The other thing is the diversification of skills. You, you, 
you know, you pick a platform, you get focused and good at it. Your DBAs know MySQL. When you start introducing new things into the system, they behave somewhat differently. So where possible, we try and get infrastructure consistency to reduce the, the, the surface vector for, for, for problems. So really, I don't think it's, it's technically the best or the worst. It does the job really well and stably, so um, th that's really the main reason for it. And we had much bigger problems to deal with than, than choosing between largely equivalent systems that all support SQL at the end of the day. Uh, is it a mono repo of only Golang code? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, all our Golang code is in a mono repo. For the other code bases, uh, such as the, 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 res the residual Ruby on Rails code, they've got their own repos, etc. So that, that is correct. And I think that's it. Okay. Thank you so much, Stephen, for answering the question. Thank you very much. Thank you and have a good lunch.